a KQED HD production. It starts with a distant call, an ancient song heard through the rising mist, announcing the changing of the seasons. For thousands of years and countless generations, they have flown this path, arriving, then departing, providing a rhythmic pulse to the natural world. People's connection with birds and their migrations goes back thousands of years. Aristotle commented on that, and they speculated on bird migrations. They definitely use uh, bird migration as a timer for their seasons. The robins showing up in your backyard and singing, the geese that show up in the fall. Today, scientists working in California's Central Valley are finding important links between bird migration and global changes, both natural and man-made. Understanding how birds use their environment and the routes they fly will help conservationists preserve and protect habitat. The information that we're getting from uh, understanding bird migration is a really powerful tool for us from an applied conservation perspective. Some of these birds are going from one end of the globe to the other, and we, we have limited conservation funds, limited resources, and so it allows us really to hone in on the key sites that are important to different migratory animals and to dedicate our resources to, to those priority areas. It's long been known that migrating birds follow the wings of their ancestors and use the same age-old flight paths. Scientists call these well-traveled routes flyways. The whole flyway concept was developed in the 1930s by a guy, Frederick Lincoln, who he was looking at band recoveries of waterfowl, ducks and geese, and, uh, and he found that birds were using these predictable corridors through the United States. And he defined four corridors, which he called flyways, the Pacific, the Central and Mississippi flyways, and then the Atlantic flyway. Up to 13 different flyways have been identified around the world. The Pacific flyway runs from the Arctic Circle to the tip of South America. Millions of birds from more than 300 different species make an annual journey up and down the Pacific Corridor, taking advantage of the best habitat conditions for breeding and foraging for food. The flyway in and of itself is a really interesting thing from an evolutionary perspective. You might wonder why birds would travel such long distances, and it turns out it's actually more energy efficient. They migrate up to the north to capture the longer hours during the northern summer. So because it's daylight for a much longer period, they're able to forage for a longer period, and that helps them to be more successful in nesting and also having larger numbers of eggs that successfully hatch. And as those conditions change and the day length shortens, they migrate back down to the southern regions that are more hospitable to overwinter. No two species follow the same exact route. Some fly thousands of miles, some just a short distance, many crossing paths in the San Francisco Bay and the Delta. This is essential habitat for these long distance travelers. For some birds, it's their final destination. For others, a crucial rest stop as they make the trek further south. You might even call the San Francisco Bay Area the Grand Central Station for birds on the Pacific Flyway. It's really the meeting point for so many different bird species. We have your waterfowl that come down from the north. We have smaller species like songbirds. We have raptors that fly through. And it's really just such a great mixing bowl for all of these different species. How birds navigate is still somewhat of a mystery. Some are genetically hardwired. Many use the sun, the stars, and landscape to guide them, while others are in tune with the Earth's magnetic poles. 
We don't fully understand how birds migrate and what might be their triggers for landing in the exact same place year to year, but it is true that you can put up a net in the same place year to year and catch the same identical bird. Biologist Cheryl Strong and her team from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service are banding songbirds at the Don Edwards Wildlife Refuge near Newark, California. So this guy's band is 01701. Once they're banded, if they're recaptured somewhere else, then you get a lot of information about the movement of those birds. You can also get information on survival and lifespan of those birds and also behavior of the birds. Joe has a hermit thrush, which is a bird that winters here. It's actually really rare to know exactly where the same population of birds winters and also breeds. So if you can get that kind of information, it's really valuable to see. If you have a declining species, um, such as a songbird or even a duck, if you know what the threats are to that bird, uh, in either on its breeding grounds or on its wintering grounds, then you can better help conserve that bird. And there he goes. Biologists are now concerned with reports that the majority of migrating songbird species are suffering population declines. Another report by the U.S. Department of Interior indicates half of America's migrating coastal shorebird species are in decline. While population numbers of waterfowl vary from year to year, many species of ducks and geese are faring better. Birds face many threats along the Pacific Flyway, from pollution to habitat loss. <laughs> to get a more comprehensive view of exactly where the birds go and what they face on their migration, scientists are employing sophisticated radio and satellite tracking devices. There's several ways you can track a migratory bird. One way is using a satellite transmitters, which this is a 12 gram satellite transmitter that attaches to a bird's back. Powered by a solar cell, the device can send information via satellite for months, even years, providing scientists a way to actively follow individual birds. Last summer, biologists trapped and satellite-tagged long-billed curlews on their nesting grounds in the prairies of Montana. Well, the long-billed curlew is the largest shorebird in North America. And it breeds in the prairies and in the Great Basin. And then it migrates 600 to 1,200 miles south. And a lot of them come to the Central Valley of California. And we became very interested in how important is the Central Valley for the wintering long-billed curlews. We found the curlews very dependent on agricultural lands, and particularly they like alfalfa. Biologists released the curlews in Montana and have tracked them as they've traveled down to their winter home west of Sacramento. We've had about 10 long-billed curlews in the valley that we've monitored over the past three years. And we found, interestingly, they're very site faithful from one year to the next. There's concern about the curlews because they're so dependent on man-made habitats much more than a lot of other species. Changes in habitat or climate can impact and disrupt the rhythm of migration. In 2009, a National Audubon Society study found that more than 150 species of migratory birds are wintering further north than they were 40 years ago. There's a lot of talk lately about migration phenology, which is basically the timing of migration based on what's happening in the environment, and the, the chance that that will change because of climate change. So the cues that birds use to migrate are changing, and it might make them migrate too soon or too late. And the danger is uh, that they could arrive to the breeding ground at the wrong time. Migratory birds are the proverbial canary in the coal mine, a warning signal of the failing health of our ecosystems. Small shifts in their patterns are telling us that the rhythm of the natural world is changing, and those environmental changes will affect all life on this planet. I think it's valuable to study birds. They're one of the best interfaces between man and the environment. 
The real ability of birds and all the different things they do needs to be appreciated by the public so they want to conserve them. The reason I study birds is because I want to preserve the beauty of the earth.